next discussion um, uh, by Dave Wilkin uh, in regards to the importance of uh, submitting a WSIB claim, whether you've been asymptomatic or just had mild symptoms. We really don't know what long COVID is going to look like. Um, and so Dave um, will be speaking a little bit more to that. So let me just quickly introduce you. Um, Dave Wilkin began representing injured workers in 1990 as a member of the Advocates for Injured Workers Student Legal Clinic, later serving for six years as the clinic's primary legal supervisor. Uh, he has worked for injured workers consultants, the Office of the Worker Advisor, the Industrial Accident Victims Group of Ontario, and Building Trades Workers Services, a nonprofit association of local unions. In 2015, he joined us here at OCAO as Chief Operating Officer. So thank you very much, Dave. Uh, leave it to you. I'm going to make this very general uh, and focused uh, on this issue of uh, the implications of the long haul, uh, why that makes it more important uh, than ever to, uh, to file a claim for, uh, for WSIB. Uh, we know is happening and uh, what we don't know. I haven't even put the OCAL logo on this because a lot of this is just really uh, speaking as a, as a lawyer with uh, experience in representing uh, injured workers. Uh, and uh, so there's a couple parts here. The reasons to report, uh, what we know about what's happening with uh, COVID-19 claims at the WSIB, uh, what we don't know, uh, but what we're entitled to assume about what the problem areas will be, for example, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the claims, and then uh, a couple words about what OCAO can do uh, to assist uh, both in uh, getting claims in uh, and uh, and then in appeals for claims that are uh, that are denied. So the first thing, reporting, super important. Uh, nothing uh, is going to happen without that. Uh, reporting both claims, which would be cases where there are positive test results or there are symptoms that a doctor uh, can uh, correlate uh, to a uh, COVID-19 diagnosis. And then uh, exposure incidents uh, where it's known that someone has been uh, exposed to the virus. And then there are two separate forms that the WSIB uses to uh, document those exposures. Uh, the first is uh, the uh, uh, program for Exposure Incident Reporting form, uh, and then the Construction Exposure Incident uh, Reporting form. Uh, you know, so obviously one for non-construction, one for uh, construction. Uh, it's especially important due to the long haulers uh, issue. Uh, less than immediate reporting always increases problems. Uh, you don't want to be in the situation where uh, uh, you or uh, a worker you're uh, representing uh, is now suffering uh, very serious uh, complications uh, despite an initially uneventful uh, um, illness. Uh, and now you are coming back to file the claim uh, only at that point. Uh, it's going to be much more difficult. Um, so, uh, it's difficult even if you're, you know, a few weeks after you knew in the case of, you know, a, a slip and fall or something, but uh, um, there is a definite six month time limit to report uh, claims in the act that you will have to get forgiven uh, if you go past the six months. Uh, and we're now in the, uh, a special circumstance uh, where all of the time limits uh, could still be met uh, at this point uh, for every uh, COVID-19 uh, case. Uh, as long as it, uh, the diagnosis didn't come down, uh, as well as the reason to think it was work-related uh, by January 15th of last year, uh, because we had a six-month timeout on statutory time limits. Uh, so uh, anything that happened from uh, uh, March 14th on, uh, then there's a six-month automatically taken out of the calculation of when the time limit happens. So it's March 14th uh, for uh, pretty much every COVID-19 case that's out there right now. Uh, so there's still uh, time to uh, get them in in a legally timely manner, um, even when it's just a, a precaution or a hedge against uh, uh, further uh, complications. So what do we know about the WSIB claims? Um, in fact, not a lot for reasons I'll, I'll get to uh, in a moment, except for the bare numbers. 
So as of uh, last week, Friday, uh, 12,909 claims submitted, nearly uh, 6,000 uh, exposure incident reports. And then of the claims uh, that were decided, which is 12,100, 85% have been allowed, 15% uh, uh, denied. And uh, you know it's difficult to, to know how that stacks up against uh, 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 sort of most claims, uh, as opposed to most occupational disease claims, that's a high rate of, uh, uh, of being allowed, but uh, that's because of the ways in which uh, this is not a typical uh, occupational disease claim that we think of, which are long latency diseases um, with multiple causes. The fact that this has multiple possible sources of infection carries its problems, but um, it does not have some of the other problems of other occupational diseases. Um, and then uh, of those uh, 12,000, nearly half of all the claims that have been made uh, come from healthcare, um, uh, defined just in these three categories, nursing and residential care, hospitals, and ambulatory healthcare. Uh, you can see the statistics, and these are uh, updated uh, regularly uh, at the link at the bottom of this slide. And uh, it, it provides you uh, basically with just this information and then the breakdown by uh, the sectors of um, uh, occupational uh, um, ratings, the NCAIS, I believe is the one they use right now, and um, but not some of the other information that you would need to uh, give a thorough analysis of the cases or any uh, going uh, in as abandoned claims um, are the cases that are being allowed, um, do they tend more towards the less serious ones or the more serious ones that you know kind of go to hospitalization quite quickly and so on? Are those taking a longer time? Are they taking the same time? Are they taking even less time to be adjudicated? We don't know any of that and we don't know the breakdown uh, according to uh, how much time is lost from uh, work uh, as a result of the um, uh, infections either. We do know uh, that claims are significantly lag lagging behind cases, behind work-related cases. Uh, so as of November 18th, uh, the Ontario Health Coalition had uh, tracked just using the available public health data, which uh, I don't believe is uh, complete, uh, 12,128 workplace outbreak cases in non-healthcare industries alone. Now we have the explosion of second wave cases in long-term care as well. And uh, when I was uh, going through the, um, uh, uh, the process of uh, calling workers' comp reps um, earlier in the year and then uh, more recently, uh, there are uh, widespread reports of uh, uh, direct employer claim suppression, um, incidents of people, workers just simply being told by the employer that you know they were infected in the community rather than at work. Um, some cases where employers have reported to the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development that there's uh, an outbreak in the workplace, uh, but not filed any WSIB claims uh, as a result of that. Uh, and of course, that would be a violation of WSIB reporting obligations into issues of uh, maybe the worker doesn't really want to claim WSIB, that sort of thing. And uh, um, and the next uh, item on the list of uh, people wondering, okay, what's the impact on CERB, on uh, CURB or CERB, however you want to pronounce it, uh, or the uh, federal benefits that have come in since September, should I claim WSIB or not? Um, all of that is actually irrelevant to uh, the employer's reporting obligations under the Act. Um, uh, even if you had a situation where a worker absolutely did not want to claim workers' comp benefits, uh, the employer would still be under a duty to report um, to, the, uh, to the WSIB. And then uh, whether or not the worker further goes on to claim benefits um, is, a, is another step uh, in the process. Uh, and despite that example I gave there, it's also important in that uh, the uh, the ministry judging uh, whether or not an employer had a duty to report an outbreak in a workplace to the ministry um, takes the existence of WSIB claim uh, being filed as uh, you know as a key piece of evidence uh, in uh, whether or not that obligation arose. Um, I've seen uh, several uh, reports 
uh, from uh, uh, from ministry inspectors that indicate that if there was just an incident report, for example, for exposure to the virus, that does not uh, trigger the obligation, the reporting obligation under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, it's also interesting uh, that there's no direct WSIB-related financial incentive to suppress COVID-19 claims. Uh, the costs of these claims are not going on to employers' individual uh, accident accounts that get used to determine what their future uh, um, premiums will be. Uh, they're not even being uh, applied to this at the sector level, but uh, only at the level of the schedule. So basically they're being shared by uh, the entire uh, uh, group of employers paying into the fund for all of the, uh, for most workplaces in the province. That kind of a financial consideration is not really only the ever th the only consideration that goes in. Uh, including just the uh, the consideration of what happens the next time around when when people are reporting something. So um, uh, we do know that the number of claims far legs behind the the number of uh, workplace infections reported elsewhere. And then we have a number of ind indirect factors at play that are just creating problems for people in navigating the the whole situation for themselves, workers, right? So employers many of them willing to pay full wages for workers who have to stay home in isolation or who become infected but not seriously ill. Um, the, uh, the multiple benefit systems that have been in operation practically from the beginning. Uh, so first the, uh, uh, the curb and now the three different types of benefits that have replaced it in September. Um, some restrictive factors in WSIB entitlement. So for example, uh, having to uh, isolate uh, because of uh, uh, being exposed to someone who was infected uh, does not uh, give rise to WSIB entitlement. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, uh, workers who are infected but symptom-free, uh, which we'll come back to in a couple of minutes. The early days, uh, just fears of uh, delay by going the WSIB route and uh, you know I, whatever ideas an individual might have based on their previous dealings with the board uh, or uh, family members or whatever. And uh, versus um, uh, when the federal benefits first came out, uh, uh, MPs in the uh, in the government caucus just openly saying, if in doubt, just apply. And many news stories about how they were trying to to process those as quickly as possible. Uh, most immediately, uh, issues about um, uh, uh, double dipping being in the news and uh, um, people getting two checks, in fact, in that program. So, what are you, um, uh, what are you uh, going to do uh, about that? Avoid that, and then the breakdown of supports, uh, which is uh, indicated by uh, the fact that we have all these uh, many denied claims, but. Uh, there are very few uh, that are under appeal that have been reported to the usual suspects in terms of uh, union representatives for WSIB cases. I heard from uh, uh, several um, union uh, workers comp and health and safety reps that um, they learned about some uh, you know, workplace clusters in their union uh, by other means, you know, for example, through the news media, rather than direct reporting uh, within the union structure and under those circumstances, you can only imagine that, uh, again, that uh, an individual worker uh, might feel like, you know, they're just going to do something else other than WSIB for whatever reason and uh, may not be getting good information. I saw a flash across in the, um, uh, in the chat uh, something about work at home. I mean, yes, that's a very important WSIB uh, issue related to this whole uh, time period, but uh, not just not one we're talking about today. Um, and uh, could have some questions arise in it that would be uh, relevant to OCOW's um, uh, other work, but uh, fewer uh, really than this issue of the long haulers and people getting infected in, in traditional uh, workplaces as opposed to having injuries while uh, working remotely from home, that sort of thing. Some of these issues, um, here's just uh, some of the considerations uh, on the sub question. So in terms of double dipping, we've seen things on the internet that say that um, you cannot apply for the federal benefits 
even more saying you just should not out of fear of getting in trouble, having to pay something back. Um, if you've, uh, if you're getting WSIB as well, or even, um, if you've applied for WSIB that you can't apply for these. Um, I cannot say uh, that there are no procedures, uh, for example, uh, at the federal level where they're discouraging people or telling them they shouldn't apply in those circumstances. Um, I can say that uh, if you look at the act that enabled uh, those uh, uh, four different federal benefits that have existed in the different time periods and then go to the regulations, uh, what you will find is that uh, uh, workers' compensation benefits are not included uh, in the types of income that count either towards uh, being eligible uh, for any of the benefits based on past income or as being ineligible for payment for a particular period because you have earnings. Uh, there are um, uh, Those are specifically enumerated in the acts and in the regulations. Um, and uh, this is, an, an, is not an exhaustive list, but it is basically uh, earnings from employment and self-employment and employment insurance benefits. And for the most part, uh, um, nothing, uh, uh, nothing, well, not for the most part, nothing related to workers' compensation benefits uh, if you go to back, back to those sources. So again, I, I'd be very interested in hearing anyone's practical experiences. I would have thought uh, that in uh, drafting that they would have um, set them out to be treated uh, as EI benefits are, where uh, uh, someone receiving WSIB benefits for the same period would then have to uh, uh, provide reimbursement or something like that. But it, it, it is not the case in the legislation or the regulations. Uh, there's also the issue of the benefit amounts. Uh, the federal uh, amount is uh, 500 a week. Uh, the WSIB range uh, for full loss of earnings benefits for a single person working full time ranges from 400 to over $1,200 a week, uh, not taxable. Uh, also, all of the federal benefits are time limited, and uh, um, and that brings you into the uh, risk benefit analysis of there's the potential for serious permanent harm here, and uh, at this point, it's largely uh, unknown. Uh, even what the range of those harms are, um, let alone uh, um, uh, how one would um, uh, uh, determine what's work-related and so on. It is making things much more difficult to delay making a claim. So again, this comes down to uh, that the, the number of things producing uncertainty. Uh, around this issue uh, with the WSIB. The easy way, um, and um, this is uh, certainly uh, something that the uh, uh, managers of the WSIB take great pride in the, uh, um, the high levels of approval they get from large numbers of uh, workers who are randomly sampled uh, who have uh, no lost time claims or very short claims. Uh, if a claim fits into the conveyor belt that you need to have to process many thousands of claims every year, if it fits into that uh, uh, that process nicely, uh, there's not a lot of reason to be dissatisfied. But to do that, um, you really have to have an identifiable incident then a form that says, yes, and this was seen by these two people. Uh, it was reported to the employer immediately, employer report it immediately to the WSIB as well and says, and I have no reason to doubt this, um, absolutely, I was one of the witnesses. Um, the, uh, the fallout in terms of symptoms is immediate, medical treatment immediate, the doctor sends in their form immediately, says, yes, this is absolutely a textbook case of everything this person's complaining of is caused by that type of an injury. Um, and uh, here are the medical restrictions, which are very clear. And the employer says, yes, I can meet those. Come back to work tomorrow while it's still a no lost time claim. And then uh, the, within whatever the board's computer system says is the normal recovery time, um, uh, they never hear from you again. And uh, that is a, uh, you know, a claim that you're never going to see again unless the worker has another one down the line or a recurrence down the line. Um, but um, that's how they go through satisfaction and uh, without problems. Uh, 
Occupational disease cases are normally uh, not like that. They take a longer uh, amount of time. There's a degree of uncertainty in almost every one due to the, uh, the multiple possible causes. And here we have uh, multiple uh, sources of infection as well as uh, multiple symptoms. And further down the road, as these long haul issues uh, come to the fore, just the question of none of those conditions are uh, completely specific to um, uh, COVID-19. Um, so how do you prove that in this particular case, it's caused by COVID-19? So again, uh, in terms of just a, a general, general legal information, um, uh, my advice to people I, I was representing at this time would be to, uh, to file uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, not have that problem, especially if you have maybe even have lingering symptoms still now, but they're not that serious. Again, we can't uh, we can't be sure that they're going to stay not very serious, or that they're going there's going to be a full recovery uh, in any kind of a short period of time. Brings us to the problem areas known and uh, uh, and uh, that we can extrapolate from other experience. So the claim suppression and delayed reporting again, it's going to create problems in in cases where uh, a report doesn't go in until um, until some much more serious consequence uh, comes about. Um, assumptions regarding community and workplace risks of transmission. Uh, and this has, this is obviously very closely tied with some of the other uh, issues uh, down below. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, we have uh, assumptions being made here about uh, the, the modes of transmission, about whether it's airborne or not, issues on which the um, uh, uh, general acceptance of the science has, uh, has moved along. Uh, but where the, uh, for example, the um, position of Public Health Ontario, as opposed to uh, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada or the uh, WHO is still that, you know, um, it is uh, fundamentally not airborne, uh, that there are only very limited circumstances in which that becomes uh, uh, relevant at all. So uh, what kind of assumptions is the WSIB going to be making about uh, what are the risks uh, for different activities? I'll come back to this standard issue in a second, as well as uh, assumptions about the effectiveness of workplace protective measures. So the early uh, statements about no need to wear a mask and uh, all that sort of thing. Again, we're sort of working backwards from infection control. People say this is how it's uh, how it's being transmitted, and therefore this type of uh, personal protective equipment is enough. But if they're wrong, that personal protective equipment um, is much more likely to have been uh, ineffective in a particular case and so on. So what what is the board uh, uh, assuming when it looks at those uh, at those cases? Uh, determinations about the order and number of infections in a workplace and the conclusions that are drawn. So there um, actually most of the uh, particular individual cases where entitlement was denied uh, that uh, I was able to find in my discussions with uh, representatives actually were around this issue of um, one uh, denied uh, because uh, the worker was not able to confirm uh, a COVID-19 diagnosis because they were never tested. Uh, uh, they were told at that time not to go to a testing center. And again, we've just, from the newspapers, we've seen uh, the ebbs and flows of this kind of thing of uh, different advice that changes from week to week to week. Um, testing is not the only way to establish the diagnosis. It can also be based on symptoms um, and, uh, uh, and a, a doctor's um, uh, opinion on how that fits together with a COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, but, uh, you know, it's an issue. But then also other issues are, you know, is the is the test a false uh, uh, a false negative, and uh, who's been tested, and in what order? Uh, another one, another uh, denial that I'm aware of was that uh, everyone in a workplace uh, break uh, was accepted, uh, except for the person that they determined was the first one to be infected, because they thought that that person must have brought it in from uh, from the community. And then uh, the final one was uh, 
the person was the only one known to be infected in that workplace. So therefore, they must have gotten it into the community. Uh, and all of those kind of determinations uh, rely on uh, knowing the answers to a lot of questions uh, that where the board may or may not be on solid ground again, uh, and it, it needs exploration. Uh, and then there's the, the separate standards. So the WSIB uh, adjudicative approach document says, uh, the worker's employment must have created a risk of contracting the disease to which the public at large is not normally exposed, plus then confirmation of having the disease. Uh, the tribunal decisions on infectious disease are very few and far between, but um, to the extent that they've commented on that, it's to say, well, no, it doesn't have to be greater than the risk facing the community uh, at large. That's not part of the test. It's just significant contribution. Uh, but then, you know, you get into a whole bunch of uh, fine legal points there on uh, a significant contribution to the risk and uh, uh, judicial commentary on on that, but uh, which we won't get into. But there's a lot to uh, a lot to look at in any of these cases, and then the adjudicative approach document also deals with symptom-free workers. Now, I mentioned before that uh, certainly, if someone is uh, put into isolation uh, because uh, of an exposure issue, but there's no confirmation ever uh, that they uh, were infected uh, or suffered from the disease. Um, there's no grounds under our act uh, to uh, compensate them. Uh, but to say, uh, as the board does in their document, uh, symptom-free workers are not entitled to benefits is again uh, to, uh, I think, uh, build a lot in uh, through analytic confusion to act as though being symptom-free is the same as that, uh, even if the worker is infected. Uh, I don't think it is. Uh, for one thing, there's uh, subjectivity just around uh, what is a symptom. Uh, the, the dictionary definition of a symptom, uh, which you're definitely allowed to go to in a case like this, is uh, a physical or mental feature which is regarded as indicating a condition of disease, and especially those of which the patient is aware. We usually only include uh, those things that the uh, patient would be subjectively aware of or uh, that are uh, objectively measured as a functional abnormality in some way. Uh, but the definition of impairment in the act is any physical or functional abnormality or loss. Uh, and that is going to include on the physical abnormality end, I would argue, uh, just the infection itself uh, but certainly many things uh, to which the um, uh, the worker would not uh, um, put their attention, uh, things that they would not want to claim as symptoms necessarily in the middle of a, an outbreak of, um, uh, of a deadly disease uh, to feel just like they're complaining. If they're suffering from, from a little fatigue, um, you know, why would I, you know, raise that as an issue with my doctor? Um, uh, so that, you know, my record may come up as um, no symptoms uh, based on a, 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 an interview with the doctor over the phone when that is my only symptom. So uh, again, there's a, there's a lot of that uh, issue, but um, to my mind, uh, if you can demonstrate an infection, uh, that's an impairment under the act. And then it's a question of whether or not the, uh, the employer has work uh, that the worker can do uh, from home. The infection itself says they cannot go into the workplace, uh, then there's either uh, work that their symptoms as uh, experienced allows them to do or not. Uh, and that's what the entitlement to benefits depends on. All of the cases, um, OCAL can help in that uh, we've had a committee working on, uh, uh, working on COVID, looking at uh, the science, we've been producing uh, papers and uh, helping uh, uh, helping people with uh, return to work issues, et cetera. So issues that arise in WSIB claims around the modes of transmission, uh, the effectiveness of PPE and other protective measures in the workplace, the reliability of uh, testing, uh, contact tracing, which is a different issue if you're really looking to get to the root cause of any individual's disease than the type of contact tracing done by uh, public health. Uh, there's a whole protocol worked out by the um, uh, NIOSH in the U.S. Uh, looking at that in occupational circumstances. Uh, Up-to-date medical information, assessment of whether, you know, secondary conditions are related to, uh, to the COVID infection, 
uh, you know, based on the, the latest science, all those sorts of things that we are able to help with. Don't do issues of, in any case, so also not here, around the level of disability sort of is a job, uh, job suitable given a worker's uh, symptoms. Anything else, uh, really, uh, we would uh, endeavor to uh, uh, provide some answers. Uh, so our relevant services, again, general information, uh, primary prevention assessment and uh, advice if you're negotiating with an employer around uh, um, issues of uh, how work is going to be done or ramping up or going back, all those sorts of things. Uh, review of individual cases that uh, have been denied and uh, are uh, uh, under appeal. And then uh, intake clinics uh, for workplace outbreaks, which, um, we have a whole uh, procedure uh, that goes into uh, occupational disease, usually intake clinics, involves getting the claims submitted, uh, which would be a major goal uh, here, uh, documenting the work processes and conditions, what are the, you know, what would be uh, the available modes of transmission in a workplace, assessing individual cases where that's necessary. Uh, and all this can be done remotely. We've been working on some of our uh, occupational disease uh, clusters uh, involving uh, uh, miners and uh, plastics workers and so on, um, uh, GE, Peterborough workers. Uh, we've been doing that remotely uh, from start to finish uh, for some of them. Uh, and uh, that is tailored to the situation, right, of what we're looking at. Uh, again, in terms of COVID, a lot of the early stuff would be just uh, getting people out, creating the momentum for uh, the filing of claims. Uh, to make sure that no one gets uh, uh, gets left behind. Uh, and then, uh, you know, those could be done for an individual workplace uh, where there's been an outbreak. It could be done by industry where there's a, an industry with a number of small workplaces where some of them have been hit, but maybe others not yet. Uh, those sorts of things that would be tailored to the, um, to the situation. And uh, we're always uh, uh, anxious to uh, hear from uh, unions who would, are interested in that, think that might be helpful. And we're, we're in discussions with a couple right now. It's uh, the end. Thank you very much, Dave. A lot of information there to take in, um, but very important uh, looking at those numbers and hearing the underreporting and the reasons for, um, you know, very important to recognize that, it, that we do need to encourage people to be um, filing their WSIB claims. So thank you very much for that. Uh, appreciate it. I just want to quickly say, everybody, we've got about four minutes, but we will continue beyond three. So for those of you that can stay uh, for the Q&A session, um, please do. And then following the Q&A session, we'll have a uh, some closing statements uh, leading into our next COVID session um, from Alec Farquhar. So let's start. I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, who is going to um, facilitate our questions here. So Jennifer, are you? So I have uh, one question for Pravesh from Val. She asks, I've heard a couple of presenters mention that virus particles that are inhaled deep into the lungs, particularly in higher quantity or dose, likely lead to more severe acute illness. Think that would be parallel for the likelihood of long-term impact. And are there any implications with respect to prevention? Example, consciously minimizing uh, risks while singing and exercising. Or outside only. Yeah, basically, the greater the amount of viral viruses that you inhale, the more likelihood of a worse outcome. So yes, the dose does make a difference from from what we know. The second part was so procedures where someone is singing and uh, music instruments. Yeah, it, um, sorry, I'll clarify. Uh, yeah. It was more around. I was trying to think in terms of prevention uh, and that having heard recently um, about these acute effects probably related to the ACE2 receptors deep in the lungs, which would then cause um, closer to the heart, literally, as well as, I guess, medically, uh, um, mm. that, that that would be potentially the reason for some people getting more severe illness than others. Is there a parallel with the more it's not chronic because it's not chronic exposure, but the more long-term impact. And then should we be thinking of any of this in terms of uh, severity messages, but around prevention of, of, of those deep inhalation risks? Because we think of singing and talking as being that people are spewing so that the, the, the generation of the risk, not the inhalation risk for the other people in the room. 
Thanks, Val. So, so basically, from my reading, what I've come across is various theories, and that being one of them. But to date, I haven't come across anything that specifically identifies a, a, a mechanism that says this is it. Uh, so, yes, in theory, there are various mechanisms out there, but I, I think it's still early, and, and we just need to continue watching it. Uh, there's, there's nothing definite out. And I think just just a comment that that in theory it was a similar postulation with the ACE2 inhibitors for high blood pressure. Initially, they said, "Wow, it's the same mechanism, so potentially your blood pressure me medication could be making things worse." And then later on, they discovered, "No, it's not. It, 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 in real life, it doesn't happen." Great, thank you, Prabhash. Actually, Jennifer, if I could get you to hold for a moment in regards to the questions, um, just to be respectful of uh, Alec's time as well as the presenter's time. Um, Alec, if you wanted to uh, do the closing remarks uh, now leading into next week, so everybody has an opportunity to um, to hear what you have to say, and then those that want to stay for the Q&A, uh, we can continue with those once Alec is, is complete. If that's all right, Alec? That sounds great. I really appreciate it. Perfect. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm um, really so pleased and proud to be part of this event today. Uh, it's making me remember a lot of folks from uh, times past at OCAL. And uh, right now we've got Pravesh and, and, and Dave, uh, and we're valued uh, longtime colleagues. So thank you very much. So uh, thanks, OCAL, in general. Uh, to Pravesh for this excellent medical overview, Dave, for just an unbelievably timely presentation on workers' compensation. Uh, we can see from Pravesh's presentation there are going to be a lot of long-term cases, both a physical and psychological impairment, so workers' comp will be vital to a lot of workers. I want, uh, for those maybe if it's your first time on an OCA webinar, to know that this is just one, the most recent, of an outstanding series of webinars. They played an invaluable role in getting vital information to our occupational health and safety system, as well as to employer and worker representatives. Uh, you can just see from the participants on this webinar how significant the numbers are and the people who are attending. So this has helped us with prevention during the pandemic, and also it's helped us create a community of collaboration to maximize our impact. I'll get right into uh, my part of it, which is getting us ready for the next OCAL session on the 29th, or at least the next one on COVID. Uh, starting by st stating that the route of transmission is vital to determining prevention measures that need to be taken. And as we've learned through so many human tragedies this almost past year, frontline workers in healthcare and a number of other sectors have faced intense exposures. It's led to serious illness and for some of them to their death. Uh, many of you will know that issues arose early in the pandemic about the roots of transmission. So when, when you can't agree on the roots, you're really in trouble because you don't know how to do prevention properly. The World Health Organization guidance, which was essentially adopted in Canada and Ontario, focused on exposure by droplet and contact. So close in, big drops, touching things. But right from the beginning, myself and many, many other people in the worker community and many experts in the field such as infectious disease, aerosol science, engineering, and occupational hygiene, argued that we had every reason to adopt the precautionary principle and protect workers and the public from aerosol transmission. And you never like to say, I told you so, but it's just the truth of the matter. We were proven right. And unfortunately, PPE shortages, especially the 95 respirators, played a major role in, in my opinion, very bad policy making which led to the abandonment of the precautionary principle by Ontario in March of 2020. All this was completely preventable and foreseen. We had allowed our stockpiles of N95 respirators in Ontario, 55 million of them, to expire without replacement. And we were landfilling them as late as late 2019. Just think of that. And all this is gonna come out in inquiries and everything, but for heaven's sakes, it was foreseen, it was planned and it was abandoned. And to add to the problem, we abandoned proactive inspections of long-term care homes a couple of years ago. So along with other factors, we created a preventable situation, a recipe for disaster that came upon our long-term care homes. So in my opinion, the issue of aerosol transmission is not just a scientific, a medical issue. It is a life and death issue for workers and the public. 
it was, and it still is. The science has developed a lot since March of 2020. OCOW has highlighted this in a number of webinars. And there have been a whole lot of collaborative, multidisciplinary experts, uh, multidisciplinary collaborations by experts around the world. And many of you will know OCOW is famous, really, for uh, leading the way on an interdisciplinary approach to problem solving in occupational health. So that happened. 239 experts wrote a letter to the WHO in July of 2020. It had an impact. And so we thought, why can't we do that in Canada? So a coalition came together in December, five organizations, Workplace Health Without Borders. I'm on, I'm on the board of that organization, as are several on the call, including uh, Kevin Hedges. Masks for Canada, the Canadian Registration Board of Occupational Hygienists, and then two Quebec organizations, very significant ones, Mission Panache and COVID Stop. We have a big presence in Quebec. We developed an open letter uh, that took the holiday time <laughs> away from a lot of us. We released it January 4th was signed by over 360 credentialed Canadian experts in the broad range of disciplines, including over 80 with recognized expertise in the very area of transmission, including 52 from Canada and 34 internationally, including many of the biggest names in the field. So it was very widely supported and by a number of organizations as well. Our letter focused on the need for two main responses to aerosol transmission improved ventilation, and broader use of more protective PPE, especially close in to infectious or potentially infectious people. We've already seen results. I'm proud to say, and I think a couple of people have posted it, that the Public Health Agency of Canada has released two significant re revisions to its guidance around ventilation and around PPE and acute health care. They still fall short of what uh, a number of us would like to see, but they're a big step forward as well. So our coalition is calling at minimum that all provinces and territories adopt this guidance immediately. There is no more excuse for this. Ontario is lagging in some of these areas, although it has um, improved Directive 5 quite a bit uh, after a whole lot of back and forth with the healthcare unions. I provided the links to the guidance and now the letter. You can still sign the letter. We closed the uh, signatures for a little while for purposes of the media and now we've opened it up again. I provided the link in the chat. If your organization would like to sign on, please get in touch with me directly. I've provided my email address. And everybody, and tell your friends, come to our upcoming OCAO webinar. It's going to be Friday, January 29th, the same time slot, 1.30 till 3. It will feature three of the main experts who signed the letter and promoted it. And these are all folks that I've become friends with in an intensive month of work. Dr. Ray Tellier, a microbiologist from McGill, who was a leader in Canada on the 239 expert letter, Dr. Stefan Bilodeau, a prominent expert in ventilation engineering, and he has reached out and gotten support from a whole lot of engineering organizations. And I think it was yesterday from the Ontario, I think it's called the Ontario Society of Professional, uh, um, Professional Engineers, and Simon Smith, who is one of Canada's leading experts in respiratory protection. And those of you who know Simon, know that he had a long career at 3M, so he knows about the manufacturing as well as the use, and he's been the leader in the Canadian Standards Association around respiratory protection standards for Canada. So Ray's going to review the science around transmission. Stefan will address a whole range of practical prevention solutions using ventilation. Simon's going to review the respiratory protection options and which are best in various settings. So this is not going to be a theoretical session. It's very practical. We can give you leading edge information and recommendations from very major experts on responding to aerosol transmission in this crucial, hopefully final phase of the pandemic. And I've also uh, put in the chat the link to register and I hope to see many of you there. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks uh, Patricia for letting me uh, present this background and everybody, we're all in this together. But the most important thing about being it together is that we do things together. So let's get out there and, and improve prevention. We've still got a chance to make a very big impact. We can save lives these next few weeks and months if we do more and better than what we've been doing so far. Not a blame game, but for heaven's sakes, let's get together and do a better job of it. Bye.
Thank you so much, Alec. And that's a, a great message to kind of leave on. We need to we work together and do this together. There's so much more that we can be doing. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And uh, please do take a look at the link that, that Alec has provided in our uh, chat box there. And um, certainly we hope to see you all at our COVID, uh, COVID session uh, on January 29th. So thank you, Alec. Um, so let's go back to the Q&A and we'll have Jennifer, um, if you can take a look uh, back and see what other questions we have, please. Thank you. Patricia? Um, Julia asked, is the NIOSH contact tracing standard publicly available? And are there other standards available for contact tracing used in workplaces? Um, I've just put a link into the, uh, the chat to the... Um... Uh, the page with various NIOSH contact tracing resources. There's a, a number for different types of workplaces and introductory materials and so on there and uh, links off to other sites as well. Great. Thank you, Dave. The last question I see is from Steph, um, who asks, is it true that hypertension and asthma have been proven to be a mild risk factor for the hospitalization with COVID-19? Initially, when COVID first uh, started, uh, both asthma and hypertension were regarded as uh, significant risk factors. But as time has evolved, uh, mild to moderate type uh, asthma has been uh, not noted as a risk factor. And same thing with high blood. Well, high blood pressure is a little bit controversial. I've seen articles that said uh, it's no longer a risk factor. And then I've seen publications that have stated uh, it's still a risk factor. But generally, well-controlled mild hypertension um, should be fine, but anything more than that is, is still being debated. As, as a default, um, taking uh, precaution into consideration, I, I would uh, be careful of the hypertension answer. But asthma, for sure, uh, well-controlled mild asthma has been taken off that list. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jagnandan. So that was the last question in our chat section. Um, are, are there any online questions? Anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask um, Dr. Jagnandan or Dave any questions? Okay, so hearing none, I wanna say thank you very much to all of our presenters. Um, uh, definitely an educational session, a lot of fantastic information in there. Thank you so much. And thank you all to uh, those participants who joined us today. We absolutely appreciate your time. If you could please take a moment uh, at the end of the session to complete our um, feedback survey, that would be wonderful. Um, everybody have a safe and wonderful uh, day and afternoon. Take care.